Today is the first class feast of St. Michael the Archangel. The epistle is taken from the Apocalypse, chapter 1. In those days God signified the things which must shortly come to pass, sending by his angel to his servant John, who has given testimony to the word of God and, to, and the testimony of Jesus Christ, what things soever he has seen. Blessed is he that readeth and heareth the words of this prophecy, and keepeth those things which are written in it, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him that is, and that was, and that is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 18. At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who thinkest thou is the greatest, the greater in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, calling unto him a little child, set him in the midst of them, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And he that shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone should be hanged about his neck, and that he should be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of scandals, for it must needs be that scandals come, but nevertheless woe to that man by whom the scandal cometh. And if thy hand or thy foot scandalize thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to go into life maimed or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye scandalize thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Of course, the church fathers explaining this, the church forbids mutilation, self-mutilation. So obviously Christ means here to cut off the occasions of sin. Even if someone is very close to us, if they are leading us into sin, it's better to cut, cut off or unstitch anything that leads us to sin. These are called occasions of sin. It is better for thee, having one eye, to enter into life than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. See, what, see that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that there are angels in heaven Always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. Today is the 25th anniversary of the retreat house here in Ridgefield, Connecticut when it was uh, handed over from being the seminary to the retreat house. And I was there at the time. Bishop Williamson had just come back as a newly consecrated bishop. I remember Archbishop Lefebvre uh, had, Arch had Bishop Williamson appointed as, as father, of course, to Ridgefield in, uh, in the early 80s. Archbishop Lefebvre was fully aware of what Bishop Williamson taught, what his views were. And he had a great esteem for him, so much that he chose him among the first choices to be the bishop for, to continue Catholic tradition. So Archbishop Lefebvre, he had no problem with speaking the truth, no matter how politically, unpolitically incorrect it might appear. But the truth is what matters. And uh, Bishop Williamson, as unpopular as some of his views may be, that's, that's too bad. The Archbishop Williamson 
Archbishop Lefebvre saw Bishop Williamson uh, was a pillar in the light for the truth. So he was chosen to be a bishop in 1988. And June 30th, he was consecrated. I had the happiness to be there at the consecrations. It was an impressive, impressive ceremony. And uh, to see the Archbishop uh, himself, and I told Father Robinson, actually, Father Robinson was here in Richfield. We were together as seminarians at the ceremony, and we were walking in a cone. And there was you know, thousands and thousands of people, and I said to Father Robinson, I don't know if we're ever going to get to see Archbishop of Feb. There's so many people. So we decided to go visit the chapel in a cone, and the interior chapel, not the outside tent, and we went inside, no one was in the hall, we walked up the hall, and there, walking down was, lo and behold, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, which to us was like an apparition. <laughs> and we were so happy to kiss his ring, and, and Father Robinson said, I'm studying in the United States, I'm from Australia. And the Archbishop smiled and, and you know, said you know, to Father Robinson, well, good, persevere. And then I said to him, uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for saving the church. And he smiled and he pointed up and he smiled and he said, we must thank God, we must thank God. And he walked on because he had a busy day. So, um, so uh, Bishop Williamson came back in 1988 in September in Winona, and it was during the summer that we loaded the trucks. Uh, early in the spring, late spring, we were already loading up some trucks for the great move. And Father Lafitte had visited the retreat house, which would be turned into turned into the retreat house. He was inspecting everything, seeing what he would do with all the buildings. So it was, a, of course, a mark in the history of the society. And uh, the purpose, of course, of all the retreats, of, of the continuation of bishops, of teaching the faith of the seminary, is to keep the faith. It was for no other purpose. And now, now we're in another chapter. So do pray for, uh, uh, obviously, the Pope to consecrate Russia. Pray for the four bishops. Pray for Bishop Fillet to, to wake up. He has to step down. There's no a, a businessman doing the damage that in a business. If he's done the damage that was done with the society, he would just have to step step down. No matter how honest and good-hearted he was, the damage is done. And uh, this is how grave the situation is in our dear society. So do pray, and especially pray for Bishop Williamson, who suffered expulsion. Remember, St. Alphonsus Liguri was also expelled from his own, his own congregation that he founded. <laughs> so, crazier things have happened. And uh, so pray for him and pray for uh, the work of the Society of Pius X, Marian Corps, Resistance, whatever. It's just, it's nothing new. It's just continuing what we were ordained to do, what Bishop Williamson was consecrated to do, what every priest and Catholic is supposed to do, which is to keep the Catholic faith, the true sacraments, without compromise. And if there's a danger or steps towards compromise, or actual compromise, then you have to resist. Every single Catholic on earth must resist. It's not just, oh, I'm joining this club. No, it's no club. We're Roman Catholics. And we want to stay Roman Catholic, even if we're forced out to the woods to have Mass. We'll go. We're not going to compromise the Roman Catholic faith of tradition and the true Mass by calling the new Mass, for example, legitimate or legitimately promulgated. That's to give in. That's, that's suicide. And to accept Vatican II as deepening and enlightening tradition is to swallow Vatican II and the poison. And so it's in the bloodstream of the society. And it's killing. It's going to kill it. You don't drink cyanide and not su and survive. You might survive a few minutes or hours, but you're going to die. And once you swallow the poison of Vatican II, you're dead. There's no playing with that poison. 
And what more proof do we need? What more proof do we need than to see the state of the conciliar church? It's dead. It's dead. So, you are bound by our baptism, by our vows at our baptism, to keep the faith, no matter what. And we think, well, this is difficult times. And it's, yeah, it is, but we haven't come to blood yet. We haven't come to names being put on the front page of newspaper, wanted to be put to death. And if you step back to the early church, that's how it was. Wanted Polycarp of Smyrna. Wanted Clement of Alexandria. Wanted Linus, second pope, successor of this crazy St. Peter. And they went to death. That's our Catholic faith. And our Lord has put us in these times. And He will give us the grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the great Saint Michael. The great and glorious Saint Michael. One of the seven archangels to stand before the throne of God. And uh, Saint Michael, his title, Michael, in Hebrew means, who is like unto God? Why? Because the highest angel, Lucifer, who was the most beautiful, Lucifer, the, the, the carrier of the light, he fell by pride. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne, he said, above the stars of heaven. I will be like unto the Most High. Now you might ask, uh, were the angels created to see God at first? And the answer is no. The angels were not yet. In the, they had three instances. Because angels are a completely different nature than, than us wrapped in flesh, in bodies. We need time to think things out. We need to rationalize. We need to play the chess game and lose a few times to learn the game. And you get better. But an angel, once they, they have intuitive knowledge from God directly, it's called uh, intuitive knowledge by St. Thomas Aquinas, once they hear the word chess game, they know every single move, every single win, every single loss, every single thing about the game. They know it in a moment. That's the intelligence of an angel. And so, once they were created, they, were, they instantly had their choice to make and their judgment, their, 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 their eternal destination came in a moment for the angels. It was as fast as the, the twinkling of an eye. So once they were created, were they created in the vision of the Blessed Trinity? No. But didn't Lucifer know that he could never be like God? The angels knew this, they could never be like God. They were creatures. So what was exactly his sin of pride? And St. Thomas Aquinas will give two opinions. One is simply pride. He exalted himself. He wanted the supreme supernatural happiness without God. It's kind of like a poor comparison, but a little bratty brother who you know he needs help to move that box. And he says, I don't need your help. I can do it all by myself. And he's trying and pushing, he's breaking what's ever inside it because it's tilting over. And you say, look, I, I'll help you. No, I don't need your help. That's the kind of pride Lucifer had towards God. God wanted to give the supernatural happiness, the vision of, the, of himself, the blessed Trinity. And Lucifer said, no, I don't want your supernatural I want my own glory by myself. It's a sin of naturalism. It's the sin of naturalism, which is prominent today. Which, we don't need God. We can live happy with our, our technology and our earth and our science. We don't need God. We don't need Christ the King in our constitution. We don't need His sacred heart in our flag. We don't need His commandments to govern our laws. That's the pride in His back. That's why Lucifer rules today. The other opinion... <clears throat> is that the angels saw God would become man. 
And they would have to adore God in a far lower species than the angelic species. Remember, between the distance between a, an angel and man is incredible. And the difference between a, an angel and God is, is light years. Because an angel is still a creature. So the angels look down on the human species. We are lower because we're made part, we're part animal. We have passions like animals. We have, we have eyeballs. We have to eat. We have to digest. And we can feel we get tired. We have to sleep. We have to, to drink. And angels don't have these problems. We, we have to build vehicles to travel or ride on a horse or take a plane. Angels just fly. There's no worry about transportation. So, for a god to take on human flesh, for the angels, was already unbelievable. And the angels willingly saw that happily would adore if God became man. So, according to this opinion, St. Thomas Aquinas says, the angels saw that God would so humble himself to become a human being. And Lucifer said, no, I will not serve. I will not bow down before a piece of clay. And that, that is the other opinion of his pride. But whatever it is, it was a sin of pride. So Lucifer uh, <clears throat> faced the, the lieutenant of heaven. And St. Michael cried out, the cry of the rights of God that will echo throughout every pope condemning liberalism and echo through the mouth of Archbishop Lefebvre and, his, and all his sons and loyal sons like, like Bishop Williamson and the good priests battling, who is like unto God? How can we declare liberalism the rights of man, the rights of being recognized and the rights of acknowledging Vatican II and the new mass and all that, the rights of man, who, what about the rights of God? What about the rights of Christ the King? And so St. Michael rose up shouting this great cry, Who is ut Deus? Who is like unto God? And there, as described in the book of the Apocalypse, uh, came the great battle in heaven. And in this battle of heaven, the angels drove out the, the part of the angels, of which there were millions, who were driven out of heaven and thrown into hell. So the angels, the fallen angels, they didn't know by their choice of turning away from God, they did know it would bring a, a disaster of eternal punishment. But Lucifer didn't care. He didn't care. So an angel, however, um, <clears throat> there have been heresies down the centuries that said Lucifer someday would be forgiven. Origen helped this. That Lucifer sometime would be forgiven at the end of the world, but, but no. Because once an angel, or us at our death, once the body and soul separate, the, the will is fixed forever. It cannot be changed. And even if our Lord came into hell and, and said he would forgive, they wouldn't want to be forgiven. That's how horrible the fixation of the will against God is. So Lucifer, if he could be forgiven, he wouldn't want it. He, he would refuse it because of, he is fixed in, in that, that, uh, that mud, that cement of pride. That's why Dante shows uh, Lucifer as a huge winged, batted beast frozen in ice. Frozen in ice. He's He's fixed in the ice-cold hatred of God. So <clears throat> that's why hell is forever, and the damnation is forever, and the punishments are forever, because the will is fixed forever against God. Horrible thought. A horrible thought. And that's why on earth this is the time of mercy for us. Because God is very, <laughs> so good to us. You know, just think how many times we have to go to confession and come back to the mercy of God, who is so good and merciful to, to you know, get you back on your feet and walk again. And we fall and get you back on your seat. And he says, come, keep coming, keep walking towards heaven. 
So God is merciful, but once we have, that's why it's so important for from childhood up or from our true conversion on that we keep striving towards God, that we keep our will fixed towards God and pray for that grace because it is a grace because that fixation of our will towards God is a movement of grace. No one could come to me unless the Father draw him. And it's so important that we practice that conversion every day. And that's why daily prayer is so important, to convert to God every day. This is, this is actually the practice of monks and St. Benedict, that we convert more and more towards God every day so that our will becomes so fixed on God, we will never want to turn from Him for any pleasure, vanity, any material thing on this earth, or honor, or whatever. And that's the, the triumph, the victory of the faith that moves the mind and heart of man towards God who, all, who is all good and the truth so that he will trample on the vanities of this world. And that's why all the martyrs, <clears throat> including <clears throat> those beautiful young virgins, so honored by the church, St. Cecilia, Agnes, Anastasia, they, they had everything offered to them by the emperors of Rome. If they just burn even half a grain of incense to the, to the patriotic gods of Rome, and they refused. They trampled over this world. They trampled over the possibilities of having a husband and millions of dollars and vacations to the Bahamas. They trampled it all to gain Christ. So that's why in our life it's so important we we continually convert and turn the will with His grace to God. That's why daily prayer is so important. And especially the rosary. In these times when we have the whole tide is flowing against us. And the whole, uh, the whole Broadway street, the traffic is just heavily going in one direction towards hell. And taking many with them. Because the access to sin, as we know with, with modern technology and the, the means, the access to sin is, is unbelievable. So it's easy to go to hell. It's easy to turn from God. And that's why we really have to be focused and set the priority. priority. God first. The faith first. Jesus Christ the King first. The life of St. Divine Grace, which is really to live, first. And if we keep those things first, seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will be added to you. Everything will fall in place. So, St. Michael had such a childlike spirit. And he was a battler like a warrior. And he drove out uh, the fallen angels. But the echo of Lucifer's pride uh, doesn't stop. And uh, as many good authors, such as Louis Voyot, Pope Pius IX, Cardinal P. of Poitiers, Father Denis Fehi, uh, they all say the cry of Lucifer is embodied in liberalism uh, and naturalism. Naturalism and liberalism is basically, I don't need sanctifying grace, I can live just fine without it, I don't need God's commandments over me. And that is the height of human pride. And it is embodied in most modern constitutions of governments that refuse the kingship of Jesus Christ, because He is truly God. And Jesus Christ, this is very important for us Catholics who are fighting this battle. What Pope Pius XI said in his Quas Primas on the kingship of Christ, he said, and this is very important for Protestants, good-hearted Protestants, and there are many out there who are fundamentalist Protestants who just don't know the true Catholic faith. But they need to understand what Pope Pius XI said, the, the Catholic teaching. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't just come to be our Redeemer and our Savior, personal Savior. He didn't just come as Redeemer, although that is the supreme love of God reenacted in the real Mass, the same sacrifice, the same act of redemption made present on the altar. But he also came as the lawgiver, because he is God. And the lawgiver lays down the law. 
And we must obey that law to be happy, to obtain heaven, for happiness on this earth. And the laws are summarized in the two greatest and the ten. The two greatest, love God first, love your neighbor for the love of God. And the ten commandments, of course. And that's the law of God. And the law, that, and of course, the submission to uh, Peter and the keys of Peter to the Catholic Church of all time. Peter himself, the Pope himself, is bound to obey the laws of God. And that's the problem since Vatican II, is the Popes have turned their back on the Catholic teaching and accepted new doctrines, new ideas, revolution. And when the Popes betray our Lord, we have to stay with our Lord and the whole line of Popes that followed our Lord. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, as I repeat often, said to Pope Paul VI, I have to make a choice. Either I obey you, Pope Paul VI, and disobey 262 popes, and appear as a rebel and a disobedient so-and-so, or I have to obey all the previous popes and disobey you. Because what you're teaching goes against all the predecessors, Vatican II and the New Mass. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, I as a bishop have a duty to stay with the truth, and I want to save my soul. I don't want to come before our Lord and hear from Him, you've destroyed the church with the rest of them. So he chose to appear rebellious, dissident, and all the other titles he got, schismatic and so forth, to stay faithful to the truth. So Christ came as lawgiver, and we must love His law. And that's, if you read the Psalms, it's penetrated with that whole childlike spirit towards God, that dependence on God. Lord, move my heart that I might love your law, that I might follow your ways, that I might not stray, stray and go into error. Hold my feet lest the, I fall into the snare of the enemy. And that's, that's the Psalms are just full of this childlike attitude towards God. It's very beautiful. Very beautiful. And that's really the essence of prayer, is that childlike spirit. And the Archbishop had that childlike spirit. And that's why the angels, are, they're, 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 this gospel is also applied um, on the Feast of the Guardian Angels. And also St. Saint, uh, Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus. Because of the child, spiritual childhood that St. Pius X wanted us to have. Which is not just a gooey childlike spirit, but a fighting childlike spirit to defend the honor of our Father, to defend the true faith. And that's why St. Michael, the most childlike spirit, and Archbishop Lefebvre, the most childlike spirit, they're the most fighting spirit to defend the truth. So let me just uh, conclude with the uh, forgotten words of Archbishop Lefebvre. This is a uh, Archbishop Lefebvre who wrote a letter to the Pope, December 2nd, 1986. And it could very well just be written today, because it applies today. And he wrote it, signed with Bishop de Castro Mayor, also signed this letter. Rome has asked us if we had the intention of proclaiming our rupture with the Vatican on the occasion of the Congress of Assisi. We think that the question should rather be the following. <laughs> Listen to this. <clears throat> if only Bishop Follet had recovered the spirit, but it's, it's not there anymore. Do you believe and do you have the intention of proclaiming that the Congress of Assisi consummates the rupture of the Roman authorities with the Catholic Church? <laughs> For this is the question which preoccupies those who still remain Catholic. Who's ruptured with the Catholic Church? Who's really ruptured with the Catholic Church? Those who accept Vatican II and its new doctrines are those who stay with tradition and the traditional Mass. It's obvious. Indeed, he says, it is clear that since the Second Vatican Council, the Pope and the bishops are more and more of a clear departure from their predecessors. Everything that had been put into place by the Church in past centuries to defend the faith 
and everything that was done by missionaries to spread it, even to the point of martyrdom, henceforth is considered to be a fault which the Church must confess and ask pardon for. The attitude of the eleven popes, who from 1789 up until 1958 condemned the liberal revolution in official documents, is considered as, quote, a lack of understanding of the Christian spirit that inspired the revolution. Close quote. In other words, you're not being nice. You're, you're attacking the revolution. And Archbishop Lefebvre had to attack the revolution because that's, it's totally against Christ's king. And the revolution is summarized, of course, as you know, in liberty, equality, fraternity, religious liberty, ecumenism, and collegiality. Hence, the complete about-face of Rome since the Second Vatican Council, which makes us repeat the words of our Lord to those who came to arrest him. This is your hour and the power of darkness. And that hour is still, it's growing darker and darker with Pope Francis. Oh, poor, Pope Francis, he's off the rails. Now he's talking about a woman cardinal. <clears throat> what next? What next? Archbishop Lefebvre says, Adopting the liberal religion of Protestantism and of the Revolution, the naturalistic principles of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the atheistic liberties of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the principle of human dignity no longer having any relation with truth and moral dignity, the Roman authorities turn their backs on their predecessors and break with the Catholic Church. Remember, the, the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, written by the leaders of the French Revolution, was officially condemned by Pope Pius VII and condemned because it puts the rights of man over the rights of God. And if you actually read the Declaration of Independence, it's almost word for word the same. So draw the conclusion. You know, the Founding Fathers, who were not Catholic, didn't want Christ the King. They built on sand. It's logical that this, this structure is going to collapse. And it is! This president is a logical conclusion of the Masonic principles. It's, it's logical. And that's why the true patriots of this land, of our country, are, the, are those Catholics faithful to tradition. That's the true patriots. Because we want Christ as King. And when God is honored, it brings blessings to a country. When God is rejected from a country, He will destroy that country. That's why the Virgin of, Las, of, of Fatima said, whole nations will be annihilated. So the Roman authorities put themselves at the service of the destroyers of Christianity and of the universal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have a Pope Francis who's leading the charge. <laughs> I should be weeping, really. Leading the charge to the destruction of, of, of all that's left of the Catholic faith. The present acts of Pope John Paul II, and we could say St. Pope Francis, and the national episcopates illustrate year by year this radical change in the conception of the faith, the church, the priesthood, the world, and salvation by grace. Did the World Youth Day convince any of those youths that you need the grace of God to save your soul, that we need to be Catholic to save our soul, that we need to hold fast to all that Christ taught? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, the fact is, <clears throat> the scandalous things that are found and sold at these World Youth Days, uh, not worthy to be mentioned in the pulpit, are, are unspeakable. The immorality, the impurity, the vice that goes on. And you see yourself for those facts. The high point of this rupture with the previous magisterium of the church took place at Assisi. Now this is 1986, this is the first Assisi, but there's been two other Assisi's, and this Pope himself has had miniature Assisi's already, meeting with uh, Protestants and St. Peter's and Buddhists and Muslims, and calling for all world religions to work for peace. It's a grave sin, and here's, here's why. The public sin against the oneness of God, against the incarnate Word and His Church, 
makes us shudder with horror. Archbishop of Thess. Pope John Paul II encourages the false religions to pray to their false gods in immeasurable, unprecedented scandal. And Pope Francis is, is pressing fast forward all this. So how could Bishop Follet say that in 1988 things are different from now, 2012, in the last year? It's unspeakable. We might recall here our declaration of November 24, 1974, which remains more and more relevant than ever. For us, remaining indefectibly attached to the Roman and Catholic Church of all times, we are obliged to take note that this modernist and liberal religion of modern and conciliar Rome, has that changed? Has modernist Rome changed? No. And our stand cannot change. And it's not going to change for the SSPX resistance, the Marian Corps. It's not going to change for all the priests of the resistance throughout the world, and the monks, and the nuns. But it seems to be getting fewer uh, each each step of the revolution it gets fewer to stand up to defend. It is always dis distancing itself more and more from us who profess the Catholic faith of the eleven popes who condemn this false religion. So we stay with the religion of, of tradition. The rupture does not come from us but from Pope Paul VI and John Paul II and of course, if Archbishop Lefebvre was today, he would say also Benedict XVI and Francis, who break with their predecessors. This denial of the whole past of the church by these two popes, for, and the bishops who imitate them, the bishops who imitate them, is an inconceivable impiety for those who remain Catholic in fidelity to 20 centuries of the same faith. Thus we consider as null everything inspired by the spirit of denial of the past. All the post-conciliar reforms and all the acts of Rome accomplished in this impiety. And Archbishop of Febvre, as you know, he stood, he stood strong on this. And in the last three years of his life, he made it very clear, make no agreement, no discussion with Rome until Rome professes again, Pascendi, quas primas, the syllabus of errors of Pius IX, and uh, the anti-modernist oath, and so forth. And that's not at all, at all, what, what is happening. And uh, when, the, when the superior of a, of a, of a given entity, and especially a religious order, our congregation, publicly and officially accepts the new mass as legitimately promulgated, publicly and officially in an official manner, in an official documents, steers the direction towards accepting Vatican II in the light of tradition, saying that Vatican II deepens and enlightens Catholic tradition, that's to swallow it, and to also say that these things are open to discussion, such as religious liberty and ecumenism, which are clearly heretical errors condemned by the popes, and not just one pope, many popes. And for Bishop Follet to say that these are open to discussion is, is beyond belief. And then the acceptance of the new code of canon law, which is imbued with the poison of Vatican II, and uh, the new oath of fidelity. Once the superior of any given entity or institution turns this way, that's the direction it's taking. And that's why we're all put in a dilemma. Do we go along with the new direction of Bishop Follet and therefore implicitly at least accept that Vatican II enlightens and deepens tradition, the new mass is legitimate, the new code of canon law, which is the official position? I can't change that. It's written. It's documented. He has not rejected it. He has not publicly um, condemned this. So each Catholic on the face of the earth, with this new direction of the last bastion of Catholic tradition, every Catholic is bound to resist this direction. Every Catholic is bound because whatever threatens the faith in the true Mass, we must defend the true faith in the true Mass. 
And the, so the resistance is not just, you know, some little club or something. Every Catholic is bound to resist this. Every priest. And the sad thing is, not many are. Where are they? Where are all the priests that know St. Thomas, that know the teachings of Archbishop Lefebvre, that know why we're Society of Pius X, why we were ordained priests and made an anti-modernist oath. Where are they now? And a lot of them are just saying, well, I'll wait and see, I'll wait and see. But if you were on the sinking Titanic and, and you said, I'm going to wait and see until it hits the bottom of the ocean, then I'll do something about it. It's too late. It's too late. The documents already show the new direction. And it's not... It's not a false accusation. We're not attacking any persons. We're attacking the documents, though, signed by the leaders of the society. And what do you do? What do you do? Before God, we can't go with that. Otherwise, we are guilty also of accepting that new, that new religion and be betraying our Lord Jesus Christ. So we must be faithful, and we must... We must do what we're supposed to do as Catholics and society priests. We were ordained to do to keep the true faith, the true mass, and to combat the errors, and to preserve the Catholic priesthood, and we're not going to change. We're going to continue. It's not us who are changing now. And in uh, South America, uh, Father Cordoso is, is going to start already a, kind of like a minor seminary, to begin training young men, and Dom Thomas Aquinas and Father Jahir at the two great monasteries down there are, uh, are pillars of light. And in Germany, they are starting a, a, a priory. They already bought a property from where the priests will go out and say circuit masses. And two convents of nuns who have come with the resistance. And uh, Father Pfeiffer was just over in Europe He's very disappointed with the French priests, the French priests who are, they see the doctrine is attacked, but they're doing nothing. Where's the old French fire? Where's the Vendée spirit? Where's the old spirit of the SSPX? Do you remember that great letter that all the priors signed, and they sent it to the Pope, and said, you excommunicated, which is null and void, of course, Archbishop Lefebvre and the four bishops, well, excommunicate us also. Give us the honor, because we want nothing to do with that church of Assisi that rejects Christ, the true God, that church of uh, false ecumenism, that church of the errors of religious liberty and, and the new mass. We want nothing to do with this new religion. That old spirit is gone. It's gone. So pray, I beg you, pray for the priests of the society to wake up and uh, you know it's just standing up really it's standing up to Bishop Fillet and we got to pray for him and respect his authority it's true but if he's going in the wrong direction we can't follow that but imagine what Archbishop Lefebvre faced he had to stand up to the Pope and say I can't follow you in this direction then you're disobedient, you'll be excommunicated, you'll be crushed, you'll be suspended. Blessed be God. And he said himself, they call me dissident and rebel. rebel. And he said, well, if that means dissident and rebel are against the new religion and conciliar church and Vatican II's errors, yeah, then I am dissident and rebel. But if it means with Catholic tradition, no, I stay faithful, obedient, true to tradition. So these are, these are rough days, and this is more than ever the time we need the help of that powerful Lieutenant of Heaven, St. Michael. So let's pray to him at the end of Mass, we'll say his prayer, and let's pray to St. Michael to give us that childlike prayer in union with God, but also that childlike manly defense of God's honor and the rights of God and of Christ the King. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.